Welcome to my channel. Today, I will share Nathan's story of his wife cheating on him and how Nathan ultimately succeeded in kicking his wife out. Subscribe to our channel to hear this true story. When Nathan was away on a business trip for almost a week, he suddenly received a friend request on WhatsApp from someone claiming to be his neighbor. I don't recall having much interaction with people in the neighborhood, so why would someone suddenly add me as a friend? But following the principle of better to be close to neighbors, I accepted the request. As soon as I accepted, I received a message, bro, I'm single and living alone, but you and your wife make so much noise every day that I can't sleep. This mysterious sentence piqued my curiosity, and I couldn't help but straighten up, what are you talking about? Explain it clearly, the person on the other end immediately replied, I mean, when you and your wife have intimate moments, keep it down. It's too loud, intimate moments? It's just my wife at home by herself. I'm currently on a business trip, without wasting any time, I immediately called that guy and asked directly, I'm not at home, I've been on a business trip for a week. Are you sure you didn't miss here? It can't be from my house, right, the guy was taken aback, probably not expecting me to call directly. He answered, still a bit confused, and didn't hear the first part, only focusing on my questioning, how could I miss here? The sound was coming from your neighbor's house, and I heard it clearly from my balcony. I can't stand it anymore, five days ago. On the second day of my business trip, my wife called me, unusually asking how long this trip would last. I estimated it and told her it would be two weeks. She seemed surprised and her tone became higher as she started showing concern, saying how hardworking I am. I found it a bit strange. In the past, when I went on trips, she would only send a single message, never before had she made a specific call to show concern. Was she planning to meet her lover at home and afraid I would suddenly come back, taking a deep breath, I tried to calm myself down. This was just one side of the story from this neighbor. I should listen and not act impulsively. My current tasks didn't allow me to immediately rush back home to verify the truth, but if something like this did happen, I couldn't ignore it. For now, the only option was to air the dirty laundry and expose it publicly. Bro, to be honest, I'm currently on a business trip, and the sounds you heard, those intimate moments, it's not me, I said. If it's not you, then who is it? It's disturbing, and you don't even dare to admit it. Wait, what do you mean? Your wife, she's cheating? The guy on the other end spoke bluntly, clearly enduring much hardship. But soon, he understood what I meant, and his voice softened. If what you heard for five days is true, then yes, that seems to be the case. I'm sorry to burden you with this, but you are the closest person, and I need your help. There was silence on the other end, indicating that he was contemplating the truth in my words. But within 30 seconds, he spoke again. Cheating within marriage and bringing the affair home. All right, tell me, how can I help you? My heart warmed up, and the boiling anger subsided slightly. Please, help me record the sounds and, if possible, take some photos when you have the chance, my wife's name is Angela. We were college classmates, and I pursued her from our freshman year. After a year, she finally agreed to be with me. After four years of dating, I proposed, and now, counting our three years of marriage, it has been a total of seven years. Is there really such a bizarre saying, but whether it was for her or her parents, I did everything in my power to provide them with the best. After getting married, she expressed her desire not to work and be a homemaker, and without hesitation, I handed over my salary card to give her financial security despite not working. Every time I have social engagements, I inform her in advance and update her every half an hour to reassure her. I also try my best to avoid any gatherings with women present. During special occasions like holidays and birthdays, I never skimp on greetings and red envelopes for her parents. When her father had surgery and was hospitalized, I provided both financial and physical support, acting as a filial son, 
far surpassing her brother who never appeared or gave a single cent. I feel like I've done my best within my capabilities, so why is she still unsatisfied? Why does she continue to cheat and even bring someone home? After being filled with doubts and wild thoughts, I couldn't resist and decided to call her to investigate. It was already 8 p.m., the most relaxed time of the day, and I called her three times before Angela finally picked up the phone. A cold hello came from the other end, followed by silence. Why did it take so long for you to answer? What were you doing? I tried my best to keep my voice calm. I was just taking a shower, and my phone was in the room, so I didn't hear it, it's only 8 p.m. Are you washing your hair or planning to sleep now, neither? I just wanted to take a shower and relax, a sudden pang of anxiety hit me. When you're home alone, aren't you afraid without the small bedside lamp? I remember it was broken. Are you not scared to sleep without light? I fixed that lamp. It just had a loose connection. I tightened it, and it's working fine now. Just then, I heard a faint whooshing sound from the other end, barely audible but unmistakable. I couldn't pretend anymore, and my heart turned cold. It seemed that what our neighbor downstairs said was indeed true. Habits are not easily changed, such as my habit of showering half an hour after dinner, and her habit of showering before bed. These seemingly insignificant routines go unnoticed, but they often manifest in real life. The loose light bulb in the lamp and the distinct whooshing sound, the sound of our kitchen had fans starting up. She would never touch it. She doesn't cook, doesn't use the gesture-controlled hood fan, and doesn't have the habit of turning off the bedroom light and sleeping with a small lamp. Yet now, she claims to have just taken a shower, she fixed the lamp she doesn't use and she's using the hood fan she doesn't know how to operate. There's no doubt she's lying. She fabricated a reason for the delayed phone call. And there's more than just her in the house. During the remaining seven days of my business trip, my emotions fluctuated like a roller coaster. Several times, I almost couldn't resist calling her to confront her, to ask why she would do this, what did I do wrong to deserve her infidelity? Several times, I thought about abandoning my work and going back to confront her face to face. But reason told me that acting impulsively wasn't the best approach. I needed to remain calm and understand myself first. This kind of situation can't be resolved through impulsivity, it requires a more composed mindset to handle it. During this tumultuous period, I received dozens of voice messages from our downstairs neighbor, and without exception, they were all recordings of her voice. They were clear and even had the potential to disturb the peace. On the third to last day, I received a photo of them together, their backs and profiles linked, with the man towering over her, bulky in stature. At that moment, any lingering hope shattered, and my wife's infidelity became a reality. I transferred $2,000 to him as compensation for his troubles. The guy returned the money and asked, what's your plan? I hesitated for a moment and replied, I don't know. I still haven't figured out how to approach this or how to deal with it. We've been together for seven years, so saying there are no feelings involved would be a lie. But as a man, it's impossible to just ignore this and continue living with her as if nothing happened. After the initial rage subsided, I became much calmer. Now, all I hope for is that she will come clean on her own, explain why she did what she did, and let us part ways amicably. I returned home in the evening after my business trip. She was still lying on the couch, looking the same as when I saw her before leaving for work. When she saw me enter, she put down her phone and stood up. Honey, did you buy the handbag I told you about? I pushed my suitcase into the living room and sat down at the entrance to change my shoes. No, I forgot. The business trip was too busy. Her face suddenly darkened, and she sat back on the couch. After two weeks of being away, all I heard upon returning was that one sentence, and all I saw was that expression. 
I sighed and gathered the courage to speak up. How has it been staying at home alone for two weeks? Is there anything you want to tell me? There was a minute of silence on the other end, and she reluctantly replied, probably still upset about the handbag. No, everything has been the same as usual. By the way, why haven't you received your salary yet? There's almost no money left in the account. Although my job mainly relied on commissions, I still received a basic salary of $10,000, all of which she held. Over the years, even though I allowed her to spend freely, I still had some savings for emergencies, medical expenses, and unexpected events. That portion consisted mostly of my commissions, bonuses, and extra income, and the savings account was in her possession. It was a joint savings account we opened when we first graduated. But ever since she took hold of my salary card, she hadn't paid attention to any other accounts and didn't realize she had even more money in her hands. I'm not sure. The finance department hasn't notified me yet. It might be delayed by a day or two. Has really nothing happened at home these past few days? I asked. Okay. Nothing has happened, nothing at all. You're being so annoying. I ordered takeout. I was taken aback. I had just walked in the door, and she was already like this. Since when did she start treating me like this? Is this how married couples normally interact? Why is she behaving this way, thinking about it? I tentatively spoke up. I have a friend who introduced a project and wants me to invest. I'll take my salary from now on, and I'll give you $4,000 for household expenses each month. She immediately put her phone back to her face and said, No way. She sat up straight, put on a forced smile, and her tone finally softened, albeit awkwardly. She called out, Honey, $4,000 a month won't be enough for our household expenses. Just leave the card with me, forget about investments. Our life is good as it is, just as I suspected. Since we got married, she always held the salary card. She never formally asked me for money, which made her feel like I was unnecessary, and she could be independent. Now that money is involved, she realizes that the true financial power lies with me. Is that why she started looking for other men outside and wants to kick me, the old workhorse, aside? The repressed anger within me surged once again. Well, then tell me. How is the $10,000 monthly household expense budget being spent? She stammered for a while, her face suddenly changed, and she picked up a pillow and threw it on the ground. You don't trust me. You're doubting me, she said, turning around and storming off towards the bedroom. I didn't care about her, sitting slumped on the couch, reaching out to pick up the throw pillow. I've already given you enough trust, but it seems I've been let down once again. As my hand touched the corner of the pillow, a slick sensation reached me. I withdrew my hand, lowering my body further. It was a used condom, in an instant, the tactile sensation, coupled with what I had heard and seen before, made everything vivid, real, and palpable. The scenes before me changed rapidly, the man and woman standing side by side, stepping back, clothes falling off one by one as they embraced, kissed passionately, with sounds echoing without restraint, even reaching the neighbor's ears. The triumphant adulterer hid the used condom in the main house and swaggered out of the residential compound, flaunting his victorious stance. Living in the house that I had worked so hard to buy, spending my money, intertwining with other men, being indifferent towards me, flaunting her actions, this was unacceptable. How could this be allowed, suppressing the emotions that had been bottled up for so long, a flood of emotions erupted within me. I stood up walked to the bedroom door, lifted my foot to kick the door open and confront her. But in that moment, I hesitated. Is this how it ends, a big argument? Then divorce? Is that it? After the divorce, the two of them would walk away with half of my money and live openly together, happily, and carefree? 
No. The two of them, the adulterous couple, cannot have it so easy. They cannot get off scot-free, forced to calm down, a plan for vengeance surfaced in my mind. If they liked playing games, then let's play a big one. While going out to pick up the takeout, I bought a bottle of melatonin. Though its effects were not strong, it was better than nothing, ensuring a safeguard when I would search through her phone tonight. As I had no information about the adulterer in hand, it was imperative to find out his details. Since they had openly provoked me, it would be impolite not to host them in return. Upon returning home, she was still in the room, refusing to come out, likely trying to get me to acquiesce. In the past, whenever she got angry, she would use this tactic. I would always give in and actively make amends. But now was different, acquiescing was not to reconcile but to let the show continue. Walking into the room, she was lying stiffly on the bed, her back facing the wall. I leaned towards her, masking my discomfort, darling, I'm sorry, I was wrong to doubt you. The takeout is here, come and eat. Unexpectedly, after soothing her for just a moment, she responded, sitting up, I work hard to maintain this household, and you still doubt me, her features knitted together, showing extreme resentment. While my face remained calm, inside, I was sneering. It was indeed hard. Three years of marriage and never eating a meal she cooked, leaving the housework for me to do on weekends, and having to eat takeout every day even though it was brought downstairs by me when I returned from work. I, too, wanted to taste this residue of bitterness. All right, all right, I was wrong. Come and eat quickly so you don't go hungry. I took her hand and dragged her reluctantly to the dining table, setting out the takeout in front of her. After some hesitation, she took the chopsticks and started eating. While she ate, she mentioned that her father's birthday was in five days, asking if I would be available. If not, she could go by herself. She tilted her head, looking at me for a long moment, a clear implication in her gaze. In previous years, on her father's birthday, I would make every effort to attend or, if not possible, I would send some money with her as a gift for her father. This was normal. But now, she was asking about it and inquiring about my availability, which was abnormal. I'm available, I'll go back with you, I replied. The sparkle in her eyes dimmed instantaneously, and she mumbled softly, oh, indeed, it was revolting to plot to ask for money on her own father's birthday. Ignoring her sudden mood swing, I finished my meal and rested for half an hour before heading straight to the shower. Exhausted from a day of travel and work, I returned home still unsettled, physically and mentally drained. In preparation for the late night, I needed to relax and unwind. Contrary to her wishes, after she had sulked in the living room for two hours, the sound of water finally emanated from the bathroom. Startled awake, I sat up. It seemed she was going to bed. I turned off the bedroom lights in advance, dimmed the desk lamp to its lowest setting, switched the air conditioner to dehumidifier mode, hid the remote control, poured a glass of warm water containing ground-up pills, positioned myself in the shadow of the light, and then pretended to be asleep. After about ten minutes, the bedroom door was pushed open, and she walked in. Through half-closed eyes, I saw her bending over the bedside table, searching for something. After a while, she murmured something, then crawled under the covers. Before lying completely down, she picked up the glass of water, drinking it all in one gulp. Another fifteen minutes passed as her breathing grew steady and deep. Quietly, I got up, took her phone, unlocked it using her fingerprint, and hid in the bathroom. As expected, WhatsApp and call logs were emptied, but communication doesn't just revolve around those two apps. Without much thought, I instinctively opened her YouTube. When we first got married, she had a strong desire to share, posting dozens of videos a day. I always responded promptly. Watching funny videos and those she might enjoy, and sharing them with her. 
But gradually, although she continued to browse YouTube daily, she stopped sharing with me. Habitual behavior is not easily interrupted or given up, so the likelihood of her sharing with someone else was higher. True to form, there was a man in her private message inbox. Clicking on it revealed a string of conversations treating it as a chatting app, these days, my performance has been lacking. I will take care of myself when he goes on his next business trip, and then I will perform well, how annoying, why do you keep saying these things? Angela sent a shy photo. Well, stop talking about that. Can you transfer another 10,000 to me? I'm in a tight spot lately, and funds are tight, 10,000? That's too much. His monthly salary is only 10,000. I used to transfer you 5,000 every month, had to send some to my parents, and I haven't saved much money myself, Angela quickly explained, Brayden, don't be like that. I'll transfer to you as soon as his salary comes in this month, right, he's so wealthy, he just graduated and bought a house and paid off the mortgage. One or two thousand, he doesn't lack it reading these messages, I trembled uncontrollably. Not only because of their dialogue, which made my stomach bleed from excessive drinking for business, working nonstop year-round with only a brief respite, but also because this man, Brayden, was her ex, I had met this ex when I started school, and they had entered the school together holding hands. What left an impression on me was when Angela was cleaning the dorm room, Brayden would whistle at passing girls while waiting downstairs. When I started pursuing Angela in my freshman year, she was in a period of being single, having broken up with her high school boyfriend two months prior due to attending different universities. The split was because they attended different universities, and Brayden quickly found a new girl, breaking up with Angela due to his fickle nature. I thought they had long severed ties, so the person involved in the affair would be a young, vibrant lad. I never expected it to be that despicable ex, Brayden, and on top of that, he was having an affair almost like a kept man. Clicking on that profile picture, I felt a wave of disgust wash over me. Scrolling up the chat records, apart from the cloying conversations, I stumbled upon some unexpected findings. If verified, these discoveries could be enough to incriminate them both and make them pay the price. Taking out my phone, I captured all these records with pictures. The next day, I took a day off but left the house, pretending to go to work. When I was browsing through the YouTube chat history and Braden's personal works yesterday, I saw a post with location tagging, showcasing a breakfast place with the caption, must eat every day. The location was merely 10 kilometers away from my home, just a 15-minute subway ride. Scrolling up further, I discovered that Brayden had moved to the city over half a year ago. The interaction between the two had been going on for more than six months. This meant that he might be more familiar with my house than his place in this city. Today, as I ventured out, I needed to see for myself what kind of charm Brayden possessed, enough to make Angela forget about being abandoned and resolutely return to him, even supporting him. Arriving early at that breakfast place, I chose a corner seat, ordered a cup of coffee, and meticulously observed the passers-by and customers at the entrance, just in case he skipped dining in. Halfway through the coffee, Brayden appeared. He casually greeted the owner and sat at the first table upon entering the store. Although the place was a bit noisy, I could still hear the conversation between him and the proprietor, played cards all night again? How much did you win, just for fun, not much, quit being modest. With your card skills, winning one or two thousand in a night, you're much better than me running this little cafe, you're exaggerating. There are wins and losses in card games, but I did win a little money last night, the store owner chuckled, wrapped up the conversation, and served Brayden's meal before attending to other customers. Brayden seemed quite pleased from the attention, and his smile never faded. Surviving on card games all night must mean no proper job. Living this way, he was undoubtedly a gambler. Using the lame excuse of tight finances, I couldn't comprehend how Angela could have been blind to fall for him, especially with him using my money. 
Only after Braden left to enter a gambling hall did I settle the bill and depart. Confirming his presence in the vicinity was all that was necessary, the rest, I left to the professionals. Opening WhatsApp, I selected a friend's contact details and messaged, Lucas, how about setting up a scene, he instantly replied, all professionals, if you can conceive it, I can execute it, sending over Braden's photo and the address of the gambling establishment, one more gambler, let him get carried away, owe you a couple of tens of thousands, no worries, right, soon after, my friend replied with an okay gesture. I sighed in relief. Being in my line of work, the downside was dealing with all sorts of people, maneuvering among them. In the past, I found it tiresome and looked down on their actions, avoiding them as much as possible. Yet today, I had to enlist their services, hitting myself square in the face. The Lucas I contacted was one of those I had previously avoided being affiliated with. I had known him through a senior colleague from my previous company. Among my senior colleagues' clients, there were several who were notoriously bad at card games, yet loved to play a few hands. Whenever I entertained them, it was inevitable to have a game or two, and this was where Lucas came in. There was no hidden agenda, it was purely based on Lucas and his team having exceptional card skills able to lose when desired and win when needed, something beyond the capabilities of an average person. An essential aspect of contacting him was that Lucas also had a lending business. After reaching out to Lucas, I printed out the bank statement, then with my phone in hand. Headed towards a rather upscale residential area nearby. This address was an unexpected find during last night's chat log exploration, perhaps offering some crucial information that could make life more difficult for the illicit lovers. Returning home at normal evening hours, upon entering, I saw Angela sitting at the balcony table, eating takeout while watching a TV series. There were two trash bags open at her feet, undeniably containing the garbage from her breakfast and lunch. Before I could even close the door, she pointed to the washing machine next to her, I've washed the clothes, you can hang them up, reflecting back, since we got married, there had been almost no playful banter or open-hearted communication between us. This had been her usual behavior, and I had grown accustomed to it, assuming this lifestyle was normal. Had this incident not occurred, leading to the discovery of the affair between her and Brayden, I might never have questioned this way of coexistence or asked myself, why did she even marry me in the first place, straightening up the messy slippers kicked by the door, I bypassed her and went directly into the room. The two of them had no intention of hiding their affair, seemingly indifferent to whether I suspected them or not either they didn't care or were confident that even if I found out, there was little I could do to stop them. Enduring a bit longer, the real show must not be spoiled. For days had passed swiftly, and all preparations had been completed. As we made our way to Angela's father's birthday banquet, I felt an unprecedented calmness in my heart. Throughout these four days, Angela showed no signs of concern regarding her changed attitude towards me. Each day, she remained calm and composed, absorbed in watching short videos on her phone. Once, she even blatantly asked me when my next business trip would be. Without beating around the bush, I inquired back, asking what she was planning once I was away. Was she looking to have an affair? Clearly exposed, she still didn't panic, instead smiling and saying it was a secret. It seemed she truly believed she had me figured out. The banquet was hosted in a private room, for tables arranged all together, filled with relatives and her parents' friends. After presenting the gifts, I was led to the far corner to sit, while Angela and her parents were seated at the main table. Surrounded by unfamiliar faces, I felt a sense of bewilderment. This had always been the typical treatment I received at Angela's father's birthday banquets, yet I had never understood why I was left alone with strangers at a table or why I was practically ignored. Just as I was contemplating this, Angela's mother came over. Nathan, Angela mentioned the relationship between you two hasn't been great lately. What's going on? Her faint smile did little to ease the concern bubbling in my heart. There's nothing wrong. 
it's the same as before, quite harmonious. Her smile widened slightly, her tone turning frostier, I heard from Angela that you have certain opinions about managing finances. Look, Angela deliberately quit her job to manage the household and ensure you could focus on your career outside. Yet in the end, you began finding fault with her, I was just asking her about our monthly expenses, seeing how the money is spent each month. If we keep mindlessly spending without saving anything, we could end up selling the house in case of an emergency, I calmly retorted. Her tone suddenly sharpened, with such limited income every month, do you think it's enough to cover the household expenses? I realized why her mother had come over, feeling that her daughter was being treated unfairly and seeking justice for her. I do earn less, and admittedly, I lack the understanding of managing household expenses like you do. But let me ask you something, 10,000, without any major expenditures in a typical household, no children, routine meals, how can it all be spent with not a penny left? Have you asked Angela about this? I countered. Her mother seemed taken aback, evidently Angela had not mentioned this complaint to her. In today's society, 10,000 is indeed not much money, it's spent as it is, she stammered. I smiled faintly, mother-in-law, may I ask, how much do you and father-in-law spend per month? She was speechless. The total cost of today's birthday banquet, even in its maximum budget, would barely exceed 30,000. While Angela's monthly expenses had almost surpassed the costs of these four tables alone. Speechless, her mother was about to leave when Angela approached alongside her father. Her mother was momentarily perplexed but soon regained her smile, feeling confident in her home ground. Seated once more, she continued, ultimately, it all boils down to your lack of capability. If you managed to earn two to three thousand per month, would you still worry about Angela's spending? Likely not. Plus, before Angela married you, she was pampered in our home, receiving anything she desired. But why did her spending habits become so frugal after marrying you? You should learn a thing or two from your father's frugal ways, I couldn't help but let out a laugh. While such words may have sounded good to outsiders, I visited Angela's home every year during New Year's, so I was well aware of their conditions and principles. How could they say such things to me? Before marriage, Angela's family lived in a rundown rural house where a family of four squeezed into a two bedroom apartment. Their eldest son, 27, didn't even have his own room and had to sleep in the living room. Angela's tuition fees were paid off through loans during her university days, and it was my six month salary after starting work that cleared off her debts. Even the second-hand house they barely managed to buy now had a part paid with my contributions. It was preposterous for them to demean my family, considering the lifelong toil of my parents, and insinuate neglect towards Angela. Were we supposed to just act like an ATM machine, amused by my outburst, Angela and her father stood nearby, appearing puzzled. What are you two talking about? Why are you so happy? Angela's mother turned gloomy, saying, no idea what's gotten into him, suddenly, he's laughing, given that everyone was present, and the banquet was about to begin, I took out the evidence I had collected and printed earlier, then distributed it table by table. Since they treated my kindness as trivial, I saw no reason to hold back. Once most tables had examined the information and their expressions turned peculiar, I grabbed the banquet microphone and broadcasted Angela's recorded voice performance. Initially, I hesitated about publicizing their affair video, but I came to realize that it was Angela who should be ashamed for her unethical behavior, not me. After 30 seconds of the performance, Angela impulsively lunged at me, tearing at my clothes, cursing me. Her father recognized the voice and attempted to kick me instantly. Dodging her father's kick, I pushed Angela away, then reached into my bag and pulled out the divorce agreement, slamming it on the table. The fact remains that you were entangled with your ex for almost half a year. So, is it my fault for revealing the truth and being labeled a scoundrel? 
I'm done discussing this. Sign the agreement, let's part our ways amicably. Her father was about to strike, but her mother stepped in, pulling Angela aside and whispering something in their ears. As her father's expression shifted, he halted his actions and straightened his posture, saying, Let's end this. From the beginning, I never liked you, no abilities and a bad personality. My daughter must have been blind to choose you, I remained silent, waiting for her to sign the papers. Angela, who had been furious a moment ago, calmed down after her mother's whispers. She picked up the divorce agreement from the table to sign it, but her composure didn't last long. She suddenly screamed, leaving with nothing, Nathan, dream on, hearing this, Angela's father approached, carefully inspecting the agreement. Without much talk, I pointed to the contract and said, if you disagree, I suggest you take a closer look at the embedded information an object in the contract could send her away for several years. Tracking Braden that day was not only to see the man who had an affair with her but also important to understand their shared rental period mentioned in their chat records. It was critical to know how they were renting together under what pretext. Finding the rental property, speaking with the landlord, and paying a little money, I acquired a copy of the rental agreement, listing Mr. Chen and his wife, Ms. Chang. Living together, with marital designations, under the pretext of being married, while each had a legal spouse. Not aiming to destroy them, but their ignorance and foolishness had dug their own pit. Angela's demeanor shifted, and eventually, amidst her father's shocked expression, she signed the agreement and softly called me her husband. I ignored her, grabbed the agreement, and left, ignoring the whispered conversations and the fish like expressions of their family. The divorce process went smoothly, with evidence on hand, she dared not create trouble. She moved out dejectedly, leaving my money behind. As for Braden, Lucas mentioned that dealing with such characters was a walk in the park, as they were easy to manipulate when desperate. Lucas refunded me 5000 as Braden had sulked and lost control on his own, with his own decisions to borrow or continue gambling. I chuckled, unsure if my actions could be termed as revenge or a success. After sorting out my emotions, I shared a drink with neighbors, sold the house, and returned to my hometown. I had expected my parents to reprimand me upon learning about my divorce, but to my surprise, they remained silent. It seemed Angela and her family had spoken to them about things unknown to me. I thought that was the end of the matter, but there was more to come. Angela's irresponsible brother, learning about the divorce and despite the affair and cohabitation, demanded compensation for his sister's lost youth. He also blamed me for causing their father to be hospitalized due to an incident at his birthday party, expecting me to cover the expenses. After hearing his grievances, I shared the information of her new brother-in-law with him to confront Brayton, then promptly blocked his number. One lacking shame, the other devoid of righteousness, this family truly raised two pillars. Little did I know that casually mentioning, after a year of reorganizing, upon returning to this city for work, I heard that Braden had married Angela and become her new brother-in-law. Nonetheless, they were currently busy with their own divorces from him. After Braden's infidelity and divorce from his wife, he split his wife's debts into half upon their separation. Lucas had taken over the remaining half, piling on interest pressures on Braden. Unable to repay, Braden set his sights on Angela's second-hand house, concealed his debt situation, and hastily married her. Both having no steady jobs and Braden still shackled to gambling, they resided in Angela's house. Braden persistently coerced Angela to sell her parents' house and invest the money in his business. Angela's family found this suspicious but did not approve until debt collectors arrived, revealing Braden's true intentions. However, it was too late, selling the house couldn't cover the debt hole. Initially, they tried to escape the obligation. But dealing with Lucas proved challenging. They were ultimately compelled to sell the second-hand house, relocating back to the dilapidated rural home. 
Listening to all this, I chuckled in disbelief. No wonder they had always looked down on me. It turns out that their rundown house was indeed their final destination.